Managing Violence Podcast, Season 6, Episode 4, with legendary trainer and grandmaster of Kaju Kembo, the pit master, John Hackleman. You never hear Joe Rogan say, well, that guy's terrible. He's just way too tough. You can't be too tough. Okay, I don't want a tough guy who acts like a tough guy. I don't want that. He's out of here. But I want a tough person. I want a person that has toughness. There's no downside to being tough. You cannot be too tough but you can definitely be not tough enough. And that's very easy, especially in this day and age. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Managing Violence Podcast, season six, episode four with legendary MMA and martial arts trainer John Hackleman. John is most famously known as the trainer of Chuck Liddell, Glover Teixeira, Court McGee, and a host of other UFC fighters. And also, as I learned in this episode, uh, Tim Kennedy's first martial arts coach. So that's pretty cool. Uh, John is a martial artist, first and foremost, who grew up uh, learning martial arts to keep himself safe growing up in Hawaii. Uh, and then became a professional boxer and kickboxer and eventually trainer of champions. John's also a registered nurse, a former soldier, and worked in corrections and as a school owner. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. It's a really, really interesting conversation. I'm so grateful that a legend like John Hackleman has made himself available for this podcast and to share his knowledge. So as soon as we give our thanks to our brand new sponsor, Australian Warfighters Coffee, let's jump straight into the interview. Managing Violence Podcast is brought to you by Australian Warfighters Coffee. Now, as you guys know, I interview guests from all over the world, which means that I'm quite frequently working on this show either very early in the morning or very late at night. So between a full-time job, an unusual schedule, and four children, I consume a lot of coffee. And uh, given that I live in the coffee capital of Australia, I can be a little bit picky with what I choose to consume for my caffeine, depending on what's available at the time and how urgently I need it. But Australian Warfighters Coffee not only make a top-notch blend – but they also give back to the Australian veteran community by investing in training, education, and employment for our Aussie troops. So we'd like you to support those that support us and in turn help Aussie veterans with the transition into civvy life. Check out www.australianwarfighters.com to find out more or to purchase their epic coffee. As we welcome them into the team, into the tribe of the Managing Violence podcast. If any of our listeners out there purchase anything from AustralianWarfighters.com, send me your receipt to joe at joesaunders.com.au and I will send you an Australian Warfighters Velcro patch to throw on your gear and rep the brand publicly. We thank them for their service and for supporting the show. I'm joined by the pit master, John Hackleman, legendary trainer, fighter, mind, Martial artist <laughs> and all-round fun dude. John, thanks for making the time to be on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's, it's, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, John, we, we could uh, probably do a whole season of podcasts talking about uh, your career and your, and your experience in the martial arts and so on, but we, we dived straight in in the prelude while we're just chatting and you said, I need to ask you about the gun incident. So we, we're going to start completely off, off track and start talking about the gun incident. All the way. The okay. Gun? Well, as, as you know, a lot of people know, I have a martial arts gym. Uh, I have a brick and mortar gym. I have an online gym uh, and I train fighters. Those are my three main things. Um, but during my brick and mortar gym, all of a sudden there's like riots and protests, which are turning into riots. And um, one was scheduled for our town, which is a little town, Aurora Grande, California. Um, and it's for, it's for the most part a peaceful place. But I mean, there's been murders here and stabbings and it's not, it's not like we lock our door, you know? It's not like, um, it's not like, uh, it's not like um, you know, all rainbows and unicorns. But anyway, so we got a protest showing up. And, but we started hearing buzz the week of, it was supposed to be on a Friday, that it was going to turn into a riot. People were being bussed in from LA and stuff. So I started getting really nervous because 
I saw what happened in LA, Santa Monica, you know, Long Beach, everywhere, basically. And, and including a, a, a martial arts school in um, Long Beach that heard it was a peaceful protest. So they didn't even show up to protect their gym. It got burned to the ground. I mean, burned to the ground. Um, I can't let that happen to my gym. You know, that's my life. Uh, I started hearing these things. So the morning of the, the alleged protest, a cop called me, a police officer, and said, hey, I hope you're ready because this is going to get really violent. So I was like, oh, shit. Okay. I can't afford it. I mean, this is my gym. This is my life. So I got some of my top students together, and we made a plan. And part of the plan was they're going to have people on the roof because we have roof access from our gym. We don't have to climb up on a, on a ladder. We, we have roof access from inside of our gym. So we thought that would be a good idea because we could also protect our community. So both of them had guns. And that was uh, kind of like the, the Koreans in- uh, Yeah, I was going to say, you've got your rooftop Koreans. At, uh... yep. So they, they stood there, but they, they had a walkie talkie and they were, you know, they weren't going to shoot. They weren't going to do anything, but deter people from trying to, you know, do any kind of damage, basically in eye shot. And they both had walkie talkies and we had people all along the street with walkie talkies. Like, so these guys could see what was going on. So they're on top of the roof with the guns and uh, we're a martial arts school. So the people never get busted in. So it's just basically our <laughs> little, yeah. Yeah. little, very soft white people yelling, we hate the cops, Black Lives Matter. It was like, it was like <laughs> a fairy tale version of, <laughs> of a riot. It was like, it was, <laughs> so we look like we're, we're, we look like the bullies, yeah. you know? <laughs> Because I was expecting like a mass riot, like LA riots, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it didn't happen. So we look like we overshot it. So people are just going nuts, you know, complaining and people are calling in, wanting to shut down. There's a hashtag boycott our gym. Really? Yeah. You know, yeah. And um, so I started getting a little worried. I'm on radio stations, TV stations, the, uh, you know, the newspaper. And it started off with like, ah, oh, why do you do that? You know, who's going to steal anything from a gym? Why a martial arts gym? I go, they don't steal things. They burn the buildings down. That's what they're, 30% of all these protests turn into riots. 30%. That's a huge percentage. So, you know, we got, we got a lot of hate, you know, boycott this, boycott that. But then all of a sudden, like within a day or two, like people are stopping me at, Walmart hugging me, telling me to thank you for protecting our community. I'm getting calls. I'm getting, you know, people. So it turned into, you know, like four people quit their membership from our gym because these guys had guns and they were, oh God, why would they do that? Yeah, to protect my business. But anyway, yeah. but then we started getting people signing up, you know, like, hey, we just want to be part of what you're doing. You know, you're protecting our community. So it turned into a really good thing. But at first, it was kind of scary for the first 24 hours, and then it kind of flop, flip-flopped. Now it's a great thing. Well, I mean, it, it shows you the authenticity. You, you uh, are not going to tuck tail and run, uh, which is uh, no, we're gonna, kind, of, kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was that. Was, that, was that. So <laughs> All right, dude. Anyway. Hashtag, hashtag uh, the pit gun incident. All right. John, I want to... Uh, I wanted to backtrack way back. Um, wow. Ka Kaju Kenbo is like one of those arts that um, I wish I knew more about. Um, I think like most people, I first came came aware of it um, from Fight Quest. Uh, and, and obviously, Hawaiian Kenpo and, and Chuck Liddell. And um, yeah, obviously, the, ma the mainstream publicity got there. Uh, but as a as a martial artist, uh, I'm really interested in in your origin story. You know, I, I know you're, you're born in New York, grew up in Hawaii. How'd you end up in martial arts? Um, I grew up in Hawaii and, uh, you know, I think moved there when I was like four. And during my, uh, 
it wasn't really a nice neighborhood. It wasn't a, you know, like we weren't starving or anything, but it was a very rough neighborhood. Like, like almost all, anyone in a square mile, there's like 10 people that ended up in prison, you know? Mm. Um, and it was a rough, people like to fight in Hawaii, you know? And we grew up in a, it, it, it was a rough area. It was a rough neighborhood. So my mom didn't want me to go to this rough school because she knew they didn't like Howleys, white people, you know? And it was really, they were really rough with them. So we were right on the border. So she sent me to a nicer school, which was, which kind of wasn't a good thing because there's no nicer junior high school. So if you go to the nicer, softer um, elementary school, most of the people that went there ended up going to private school, like Obama. He went to Punahou, which was a very rich school. There's no violence it's a very soft you know culture there but so going to this softer uh, elementary school i knew once i hit junior high school i heard horror stories about kill howley day beat up howleys you know just how terrible it was going to be so right about fifth grade it started hitting me like shit i don't know i don't want i don't know what to do i could never go to private school we couldn't afford that you know and i uh, I got to go to this junior high school. So it's like, I don't know what to do. And my mom and my dad, you know, I didn't really talk to them much. It was a different era back then and they were busy doing their own thing. And so it was a kind of a thing I went through, you know? So I started looking in the yellow pages and I, I found a, 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 a yellow page ad I liked. So I called it on my own. And I said, hey, I want to train and learn how to fight and protect myself. And the guy was like, yeah, come on down. We're such and such. I was like fifth grade. <laughs> so I told my mom, well, he told me it was, I think it was $15. And I was like, okay. So she writes me a check, $15 or whatever it was. I catch two buses. I get there. And I walked in. It was like 500 square feet. All I had was like a couple makiwaras and one heavy bag. And it was just it was just empty room with a little office off to the side. And I was like, as soon as I walked in, I thought, this is, I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. I just, I just got a feeling. Mm. Even at that age, I got a feeling this is my future. I love this place. I didn't know anything about it. So I go in and meet my instructor, Walter Godin who was in and out of prison, very rough, tough, uh, you know, uh, guy. Um, he, I think he spent 25, 30 years in prison, wow. but he happened to be out for a little while. So, you know, I go into the office, yeah, yeah, you just go out there. There's no kids classes. It was just a rough system, Kaja Kempo. And um, so I started training there. And even though it was rough and I was like, there was only, there was one other white kid, Kevin Coleman. Um, I just knew this was going to be my life. And, you know, it, it was as rough as, and, and just bro and just minimalistic as it was. Um, it was, it was like on the second floor of this strip mall in a, you know, in a, just an industrial area. And uh, I ended up catching the bus there every freaking day. <laughs> For the next uh, for the next five six years, then I got a car and I drove there every day until I graduated high school and joined the army. So, from like nine to eighteen, I was probably there, you know, every single day. Wow, uh, wow. I, that was and it was it was that was my home. That shaped me, molded me, uh, you know. Without that, and and my instructor Walter Godin who's passed away since, um, without him guiding me into, you know, how to be a man, you know, my dad's moral compass helped me a lot. Um, but what, what I needed that toughness and without that to this day, I'd probably still be wearing a floral dress or something. <laughs> so I, I, I owed him, I, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was an experience that I, I couldn't have lived without. And I thank God every day that I, I made that call and I went there. Yeah, that's a cool story. Uh, of, uh, 
always thought that any martial art that's developed on the islands is going to be um, based around uh, yeah, real scrapping. Um, yeah. So, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> what was your training like? What, what was the what were the classes like? What was the intensity like? Um, it was nothing like mine now. Uh, physically, we did some push-ups here and there. Did some sit-ups some bag work there was a lot of drilling and sparring and contact um, um there was a lot of all street scenarios um even though i became a kickboxer and i still train there and stuff and uh, i had to actually go to a different gym when i started kickboxing so i was actually going to two gyms um, but it was everything was about the street everything was like how to take them down and pound them on the ground and you know, how to, you know, clinch here, elbow to eye gouge. And we drilled, drilled, drilled. And then we did free sparring um, a lot. And there was no kids classes. So it was just, it was just a bunch of people beating the shit out of each other. Um, <laughs> the conditioning, he didn't push conditioning like I do. Uh, but you, you got in pretty good shape sparring and drilling all day. Um, but he didn't push the calisthenics part like I do. So it was, it was just, and, it, and you know, it was a rough place with a lot of rough, most of his instructors, you know, we all wore the black keys and his instructors were like his henchmen, like they would do his pickups and his, you know, strong arming and, and, and other, you know, stuff like that. I found that out later. Um, so it was kind of, his gym was kind of like a, you know, it was kind of a, a front for some other businesses that had, he had going on. So, like, even as a kid, I was like, I would always think, why are all those weird, rough-looking guys going into his office and closing the doors? This is, <laughs> what does that have to do with martial arts? But So, Godin was like that, and but he always took really good care of, of me. And he, and he, you know, he, I looked up to him so much. And, uh, you know, he created, you know, the toughness in me. Like I said, without him, without... Without my dad, I wouldn't have had such a strong moral compass. And uh, without Godin, I wouldn't have been so tough. So with that, if it was just one or the other, it would have been lopsided. <laughs> so, uh, so you, so you uh, leave Hawaii and join the army. Uh, did you train while you're still while you're in the army, or is that something that? Yeah, uh, I, yeah I um, I joined the army to go to uh, uh, Iran because uh, they got the hostages. So. I had just finished high school and I was like, I had my first kid and I was like working, you know, concentrating on fighting and I was going to, you know, turn pro as a fighter, but I was, you know, I have a kid now and a wife, so I'm working in full time as well. Then boom, they take the hostages and I was like, oh shit, now I got to go fight in Iran because there's going to be a war. So I went down to the recruiter and I asked my dad, what should I do? Because he was in the army. He was in World War II. So he goes, you have to be in the infantry. So I was like, okay. So I went down to the recruit. I said, I want to be in the infantry. And boom. So I joined the army, go to basic training, um, and go to my duty station after basic training. And they give the hostages back. So I was like, oh, shit, okay. <laughs> so I was like, I, You've already yeah, signed up. <laughs> yeah, I was like, fuck. So I went down to my first sergeant in the office. I go, okay made a mistake. I got to go out now. I, I want to become a fighter. And, and, uh, you know, I, the, there's no war going on, so I don't need to be here. You know, you're in the infantry. That's all infantry does. <laughs> you know, like all the other jobs in the army, you got a job, you know, mechanic, you know, computer stuff, cook, medic, you know, all that infantry fights. That's all they do in a war. So there's nothing to do. You're just, you're on downtime. So he goes, Hey, he recognized me. He goes, hey, you're John Hackleman. You won the Golden Gloves last year. I go, yeah. He happened to be from Hawaii. Oh, wow. So I was like, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, fight for the Army. I was like, what does that mean? So he, he facilitated it for Sergeant Weary, um, Marcus Weary. Um, so I became, I joined, I, well, I tried out for, which was no easy task. I tried out for and made the army boxing team. So basically that's all I did the rest of my time in the army. And then I got out, uh, you know, I got out of the army and I, you know, continued the fight career. Yeah. Wow. So, 
So you came back to Hawaii after after the army, like a no. Right out of the army, I got I got um, I had an offer to be on the police force in Hawaii because I, you know, we had a lot of connections there. My dad was a well known guy because he was a newspaper writer. Um, so I wanted to try fighting first. So I told myself I'm going to go to L.A. because that's you know, it's a big fight town, and I'm going to either I'm going to try my fight career. And within a month, I gave myself a month because I already, I had a kid and I couldn't, uh, you know, I can't not make money. Uh, I actually had two kids by then. So I was like, I want to get a fight, an apartment and a job within a month. I'm going to stay here. And if I don't get all three, I'm going to go back to Hawaii and become a cop and I'll spend the rest of my career being a cop. So I went to Hawaii. Uh, I went to L.A., walking along the beach because my, my mom lived in Venice Beach. So I'm walking along the beach and I looked and I saw Jim. Walked in, I had a fight scheduled. Um, I had a fight, I had a job because I found a job that day too. And then I, I, all I needed was apartment, which I got the next day. So within a, my first week I had a job, an apartment and a, a fight all scheduled. So I stayed in LA and I'm still here in California. Yeah, wow, wow. So, uh, so you're focusing on your own career. Um, I, I think you're like what early twenties at this point. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when when did you start training people? Um, I've always done that on the side, a little here and there. Even in the army, I was a, you know, I did some training for some of the guys. Um, um, but I just concentrated on my own fighting for a, a little while. And then um, I had my third kid and then the fighting wasn't making any money. I was, I was, a, I was a hard hitter. I won a world title or two in kickboxing. Boxing, I was so-so. I just hit hard. I wasn't really that good. Um, so I knew I, kickboxing, I wasn't going to make much money, even though I was a world champion. Um, so I went to college, became a registered nurse and, um, and, I couldn't, I couldn't train like I wanted to, even though, you know, cause I'm not working, I'm support. I have three kids, you know, I'm working as a full-time nurse. So I, oh, I built a little gym in my backyard. Hmm. And next thing you know, I'm training guys back there. Like people heard about it. And next thing you know, it's called the pit and, and it's, it, it created what the pit is. And uh, that started in my backyard is a 400 square foot little, uh, little gym. And next thing I know, you know, I got guys like Chuck and everybody in that. So I was doing that, but I was still fighting on the side. Uh, then my career kind of took a backseat to theirs. And then I just completely, um, you know, retired from fighting altogether, which, you know, didn't really, it wasn't a big deal like when Chuck retired. And then, uh, and then I just started training people. So it probably transitioned in like the 94, 95 to where I just started training people full time. Yeah, it's amazing how many of the the biggest gyms or the 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 best known gyms started off in a garage or a backyard or yeah, like it like very rarely do you hear about a, a top level gym that's had any longevity that started off with a massive you know two million dollar investment in a, in a luxury you know, uh, flight center that was yeah you know, always designed to be a massive commercial success. Like very rarely does do those gyms actually hang around. Uh, yeah. It's almost like the, you need to have that. Uh, that tough upbringing of training in a freezing cold garage or outside of the elements or something to, to build some longevity in the, in the business and the, in the loyalty and the students. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, training fighters versus training martial artists. Uh, and I guess why people get into it. Um, now I assume when you, when you started, you see you made the shift over to, to full-time coaching in 94. I mean, most of the people that would have been coming to train with you, weren't didn't have didn't have any expectations of being UFC champions because that wasn't even a thing. Um, were they mostly coming to train for the martial arts side or the or the combat sports side? Do you think? Uh, martial it's martial arts. It still is. You know, my I'm probably ninety percent martial artist. I'm like ninety five percent martial artist, ten percent guys that want to fight. But uh, yeah, to be honest, like most of my teaching careers, you know. 95% uh, um, you know, martial artists, 
But the only time that's that changed is you know right at the height of Chuck. Then all of a sudden, like I got I got a bunch of new fighters and people wanted to be, you know, wanted to fight then. And so when Chuck was at his highest, that's when I had more fighters, but never more fighters than you know students. I mean, I start my guys at three years old, so it's like you know we have the biggest kids cl class in the county. So it's not like you know. But that's when I had my biggest surge of fighters was during the Chuck era. Because I've never really reached out to be a fight trainer. I've always always wanted to be a martial arts instructor. And it just happened. Chuck wanted to fight. So next thing you know, it's all about Chuck and the fighting and this and that. But other than that, before that and after that, it's, you know, it's almost all about my students. You know, they have some fighters on the side like Glover. And I have a small team that I train right now too. What was your first impression of a young Chuck Liddell when he walked into your gym? Uh, then he was, well, he didn't just walk into my gym. I went to his gym and fought him. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe tell that story. How did you guys get connected? Um, there was a guy in town, kind of a, he was a traditional karate guy and Chuck used to train with him, I guess. And he's, I, mean, I don't know, he's kind of, he's being a douchebag to me and he called me and, I just moved into this town from LA and, you know, had my backyard gym and I was working full time as a nurse and I kind of got a, a, you know, kind of got a, a reputation real quick. Cause I was, you know, I, I went into a couple of gyms and we had some dojo wars and um, anyway, so he called me and, and said what he thought I was doing was, you know, not good for this, for the art of martial arts. And, you know, it's guys like me that give it a bad reputation and, you know, we're more, he's more about the street and I'm all about sport. And I don't think he knew my background. So, so I said, well, if you think that's true, why don't we, why don't we find out? I'll come down there and we can, we can do it under street rules. And, I'll, you know, we can find out, you know, how, how, you know, which is better for the street. So he goes, okay. So we scheduled it and for Friday and I went down there with my dad and, um, I was expecting just to meet with him in a parking lot or go to his dojo and just throw down with him. But he, he was in his office. I went into his dojo and he's in his office and he's telling me how his back was bugging him. Um, but I could go out, I could go with one of his, one of his students instead. So I was like, <laughs> all right. So he, he pointed me in the direction of Chuck. And so me and Chuck went at it a little bit and, you know, I could tell that Chuck wasn't, you know, up to my, you know, experience level in, in real fighting. So Chuck start, stuck, Chuck, uh, after we're done, um, Chuck asked me if I would train him. And I said, yeah, I gave him my card and he came by the next morning and I trained him ever since. Wow. So how old was Chuck then? Uh, what's the uh, time frame? Like 20 ish. Okay, right. Yeah, cool. So, so he was already already wrestled and uh, been yeah. training karate for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. I ne I never heard that story before. That's, that's very yeah. cool. It's in his book, it's, but his book makes it sound like it was a lot more brutal than it was. It's a little bit more blood sport. In his book, yeah, he he writes about it in his book. He has a book. Yeah, I uh, yeah I need to pick that up. Uh, I remember remember it coming out a little while ago. Uh, actually, it'd be interesting because I read Tito's book years ago. I'd be interested to yeah. hear the stories. How, how do you how do you approach training competitive fighters versus training martial artists? I mean, obviously, some martial artists, they, you know, certainly many listeners of this podcast, train very seriously without any any expectation of getting in a ring or a cage. So, yeah. how do you approach that training differently? Um, or is there a difference? There's a difference in the and the goal of. of uh, of their training, but there's no difference in the way I get them to their goals. So they both have a different goal, right? So for my, for my, um, for my student, my kids, it's not to be bullied, to be anti-bullied. Okay. For my adult black uh, belts guys, it's to not let anyone take their lunch money, not to be jumped, defend yourself and your family, to be able to protect yourself and be in good health. And then for my fighters, it's to win a world UFC title. And so there's three different goals at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the tunnel, but getting there is the same. Hard work, training, um, you know, discipline, uh, good diet, 
conditioning, um, you know, so to get there is, is to, to get there is the same. Um, and then the only other difference is uh, the mental preparation. Um, mentally preparing someone for a fight, you know, most, most of the time, not always, sometimes they'll take a fight last minute, but most of the time they're in camp. So you're, you're, you're working with them physically as well as mentally. But in, in, in our martial arts school, right, they're always having to be ready in case someone jumps them that night on the way to the car. So the mental preparation is a little different. Um, but the way to get there is the same. Like the way to get there in the cage is to be in the top shape and to be, you know, have your techniques, your takedown, your takedown defense, your striking, you know, and your physical conditioning all top of the line. And that's going to give you more confidence if you get jumped in the street. Conditioning, you know, getting your takedown defense, your takedowns, your striking, your mount escapes, your all your grappling and, and all that in, in good order. And then adding that into being top shape, that is your psyching out for the fight too. So the, so all the, both those things equal extreme confidence and there's no better, you know, sports psychology than being confident because you know, you're competent. That's a really good point. And I, and I think that's uh, something I've argued with, with um, some of the reality based crowd over the years is that this idea that um, sport fighters uh, can't fight on the street or they, they wouldn't be able to manage a no rules environment. Um, and my argument's always been, well, you've got someone who's in incredible shape, who trains all the time, who is strong, fit, fast, and confident in their skills. That's, that's going to be more than enough for, for, nearly, for nearly any street altercation. And uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that uh, on the street, you can stick a thumb in someone's eye when you've got them mounted as opposed to uh, you know, having to be limited to punching. I, I want to drill down on something you talked about, about my mental toughness and discipline. It's something that uh, I just had Tim Kennedy on the show um, last week, and uh, we talked a lot about mental toughness. And Where did he start? At the pit. Oh, really? Oh, I did, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know he started off at the pit. He's, he's from our county. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Yeah, we didn't we didn't even talk about that. Damn, there's a there's a natural segue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so so I had Tim on talking about mental toughness in in the war zone and so on. How do you go about instilling mental toughness? I mean, obviously, a lot of the kids that you're training, the uh, the young or the teens and uh, becoming young adults, uh, you're talking about your community before. I mean, a lot of them haven't dealt with conflict. They're kind of soft. How do you go about transforming them into a tougher human being? Uh, with the training, with uh, making the training uncomfortable instead of, um, you know, instead of not like katas or whatever they do at most karate schools, ours is more tough. You know, it is tougher. Um, the conditioning, um, and it's it's the training. A lot of place, a lot of places like do what they call character development, and they do uh, so they they have like weeks where it's like this week we're gonna talk about perseverance and then you get a little stripe as says perseverance this week it's going to be coordination this week it's going to be i don't know whatever but you know, to me that comes more from like examples like uh like if the kids if the kids drilling or even sparring or grab whatever and he starts crying you know instead of like letting him run to mommy and, and cry you know make him finish the that round you know cry all you want but finish the round you know unless they got like a hanging off their fucking arms snapped off and shit or their eyeballs coming out or some shit i mean because 99 percent of the time it's not a real injury it's just they got their you know they got their a little owie or something so hmm. i don't know kind of that goes and i do that with my adults too obviously um where i don't you know you know being a registered nurse helps too but you know me, me, like a kid, says he can't breathe and he can't do any of the laps anymore. So I'll call him over. I'll listen to his lungs, and if he's not <laughs> if he's not wheezing, I'll say, "Get out, keep running. You don't have asthma. Go." You know, stuff like that. You know, um, and I think it is a tougher gym, just like the gym I came up with was. So I think it's doing more than just saying. Like when you try to toughen up a kid, and we want there's not you never hear Joe Rogan say. Well, that guy's terrible. He's just way too tough. You know, yeah. you can't be too tough. 
Okay, I don't want a tough guy who acts like a tough guy. I don't want that. He's out of here. But I want a tough person. Yeah. You know, I want a person that has toughness. There's no downside to being tough. You cannot be too tough. But you can definitely be not tough enough. And that's very easy, especially in this day and age. Yeah. Although... (laughs) I tell you what, if there was ever a guy that was uh, that was too tough for his own good, I, I think immediately of Vincent in a way, especially that fight against uh, Igor Vovchanchin back in Pride Ten, where uh, I think Vincent went to hospital for like six weeks or something after that fight. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but when you're you're there's there's things called a referee and there's things called coaches to throw in a towel, but when you're you know when I say tough enough, I mean for the street, but yeah, 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 yeah but but yeah, sometimes people. That, that, you know, they say they're too tough for their own good, but that's why there's a coach. That's why there's a towel to get thrown in. So that's when you have a very tough guy and, and a coach that thinks, you know, oh, I'm tough too because he's tough. You know? Yeah. So that's, that's poor coaching and too tough. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think Ensign's problem was his brother had the same mindset. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think, I think Egan would have, um, yeah, would have been worried about the repercussions from Ensign if he threw the towel in for him. <laughs> Although, uh, I can't remember if it was a towel throw or was it a doctor stoppage in the, the, after the first round. But anyway, it was... was- I stopped. I, I'm going to throw in the towel when, uh, when uh, Caesar Gracie fought Frank Shamrock. Oh, yeah? I, I'm really fascinated with the transitions uh, between you know, being, being a martial artist, being a sport fighter, going from being a sport fighter to coach. And, and the transitions that we all go through in different phases of our career, um, you know, for, for me personally, like growing up as a martial artist then getting into sport fighting and then hitting a point where the injuries are mounting up and it's like, well, you know, like you said, you know, I've got kids to raise, I've got, I've got a family to feed, I can't afford to be uh, out of work because I'm injured all the time. And then the, those transitions that you make. When you've got a fighter, let's say when Chuck is hitting that end of his career, so it seemed like his, his chin was failing him or, or maybe his um, reflexes were slowing down, like, how did you start having those conversations with him about um, you know, what's the next phase? Uh, towards the end of his career, when I had him, uh, I was just trying to change, change up. Once he lost his chin, I tried to change up his game plans because it wasn't going to work anymore. He was always the guy that wanted to go in and you couldn't change that because then that's not going to be him and he won't do it. So that would be impossible, you know? But towards the end, so I'm trying to get him to, to do more take. He's such a good wrestler, good, such good takedowns, so good on the ground. So trying to get him to slug less, you know, and, and go in for more takedowns, work his jab more, keep his distance more until he can get a shot or score more points at least, but not go in slugging all the time. But that didn't work very well because he didn't want it. He wouldn't do it. He did it for like the first five seconds. And then as soon as he got hit or he hit the guy, he would just go back, resort back. So we couldn't, I mean, he just wouldn't listen. So you can't, you know, just like you can't make um, Diego Sanchez turn into a, uh, you know, a, a boxer, or you can't turn Artur Gotti into a, you know, Muhammad Ali, it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. So he wouldn't, he, you know, he just, he wouldn't do that. So I tried to have that talk with him, but um, once the chain goes, it's not going to come back. So his style didn't fit him anymore towards the end. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was sad, but you know, that's some people just aren't going to change their ways. They just won't. And he wouldn't. Yeah. It is interesting to see how many fighters now are continuing on into their forties. Um, I mean, we just saw Fabrizio Verdun on the weekend, um, you know, 40, 43, I think. And, uh, yeah, looking, looking like a million bucks, um, but uh, yeah, it, it is interesting, uh, especially in the the uh, quote unquote post TRT era of uh, of of fighters, and uh, just how many guys are actually you know, doing well in their forties. It, it it feels like it wasn't that long ago that Randy Couture was like the the great grandfather of MMA because he was still fighting at forty, and now uh, and now it's like fairly normal for for guys yeah. to be still hovering around the top ten at forty. Yeah, Glover Glover's looking as good as he's ever looked, and he's forty. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. How has culture changed in uh, in relation to martial arts? I mean, you you obviously got into martial arts um, primarily from a self protection point of view, uh, yeah. and worried about being being bashed at school, which is uh, yeah, a reason why I think a lot of us 
got into martial arts. I do find now, like uh, hanging around gyms, a lot of kids are getting into it because they want to be on UFC. Like they they want to be on TV. They want to be, um, yeah. They, they don't they don't even watch the old school martial arts movies that we grew up with. Um, they they want to, uh, yeah. They they want to be Chuck Liddell, or probably more more to the point, they want to be a uh, Stipe, for, for example. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't see that. I don't see that at my gym. No, no. You you you're finding they're still coming in for the same reasons as before. Yeah, I mean, I get a couple, you know, um, a couple of the older guys, not older, but like in their twenties that want to fight. So, you know, I get those, but I think, you know, maybe out of, I think pretty one percent, maybe two percent of the people that are in my adult program from that's from 14 on up mm. want to ever have a inclination to fight in a cage or a ring ever. Mm. I just don't think sometimes they do after they've been training a while and they go, Hey, I want to try this, you know? So I have a couple guys that do compete that way. Uh, but I have very few people that join my gym to compete mm. unless they go in through the, I want to be on the fight team door. So yeah. And none of my kids, I never heard one of my from three to 14, I've never heard any of them say, I want to be a UFC fighter ever. Hmm. They just, yeah. Yeah, it's really, that's, that's really interesting. Really interesting. Maybe it's our town. Maybe it's just our town. I don't know. Maybe. It, it is interesting, though, given, given your reputation and, uh, and uh, I guess, where, where your fame, I guess, came from. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird one because, I, yeah, I, I, I think the same way. And a lot of people don't want to come into my gym because of that, because of the, fa- the, you know, I have a, you know, a reputation of the toughest gym in town and Chuck Liddell and everybody's fighting and kicking the ass and there's blood. And people... You know, a huge, uh, huge percentage of people that actually come in and join say, oh, shit, man, we've been driving by here for five years. We've been too scared to come in. But <laughs> man, you're an actually you're actually a family gym. We thought you'd be a you know, we thought we'd just be there'd be blood on the wall and we get beat up. So we just we peaked our you know, we peeked in. We said, hey, wait a second. It's a family gym. So there's a there's that misconception of our gym a lot. But very few people, I, this is not a fight town, you know, I don't think uh, there's not, you know, most of the people that fought for me that, you know, like Glover and Cord and Chuck and, and Tim Kenny, well, Tim Kenny was from here, but most of the people came here to train here. Very few people from this town are going to turn into fighters because it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a soft town. It's just a, it's just a soft dish town. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so just as as we're winding up, um, I'm really interested in. Um, we, we talked at the start about Kaju Kembo, uh, and uh, one of the things that I really like about some of the videos I've seen of you in um, in recent years. Yeah, I, I love that you still got that traditional martial arts heart. Like, I mean, you, you talk a lot about a lot of a lot of things that we don't necessarily hear from you know, the MMA community. Um, you talk a lot about character development. You talk talk a bit about. Um, you know, the, the traditions and, and and the strength in in kaju kenbo. Do you still teach kaju kenbo as a system, or does it influence how you teach what you do teach? Like, talk to me about that sort of evolution for you. It's it's a uh, I teach uh, like, like all my students know about my lineage. We have the the family tree of kaju kenbo on my wall. I'm I'm true to kaju kenbo. I'm loyal to kaju kenbo. Um, but I don't teach Kaju Kempo at all. I teach the philosophy of Kaju Kempo never left me. And if it wasn't for the philosophies, the concept and the, the mental toughness, which came with the physical toughness, then like I said, I'd be wearing a floral dress right now and I'd be somebody's girlfriend right now. If it wasn't for martial arts and what it, how it made me tough. Um, and I still teach that. And I still, I still uh, embrace that. I still thrive on that. My students, all of them have that. Anyone that makes it up the ladder in their belts adapts that. I even have orthopedic surgeons that don't even look, I have an orthopedic surgeon doesn't look like the same, why he doesn't walk down the street the same anymore. He's not, you know, he's still an orthopedic surgeon, but he knows if you even lay a fucking hand on him, you're going out. He knows it, he knows it now. And that, that's in him now, he knows it. He didn't before. He never walked around like that before. Um, so I do embrace the martial arts, the, uh, the martial art uh, philosophies of Kaji Kempo. 
I never really got into the Asian ones. Like, you know, I love Shotokan and the Koi Kan, you know, Kyoshu Shin. I love all that stuff. I didn't grow up with it. I grew up with uh, Kaiju Kempo. And the thing that Kaiju Kempo didn't have that they had was the, the moral compass. Uh, Kaiju Kempo guys were known for being notoriously criminals. A lot of the Kaiju Kempo guys ended up in prison like my instructor, you know, manslaughter, murder, strong arming, you know, stuff like that. And in, in Hawaii, it was huge. Uh, a lot of the Kaiju Kempo guys, they didn't have the same, you know, humbleness uh, that uh, um, the, the more the Asian arts had, you know. And um, so I had to, that came from my, my, my dad, um, that part of it. Uh, he was a very, you know, very morally, you know, uh, uh, direct, morally high, high guy with uh, a lot of morals and you know, a lot of integrity. Uh, so that came from him. But the, the Kaiju Kempo was a tough, rough, kick his ass, fuck him, stomp him, spit on him, walk away kind of thing. Um, nowadays, it's not that much like that. And it's not as tough, you know. They do Sifu and Sigung. They use Chinese terminology, which is whenever they do that, I know they came from the, the, the new Kaju Kempo. Old Kaju Kempo wasn't like that. It was, you know, master, you know, uh, it was instructor, chief instructor, uh, you know, master, grandmaster, professor. We didn't use, there was no Chinese uh, terminology or any of that. So, um, so that's one of the things it kind of it softened when it came to the mainland. Kaju Kempo started in Hawaii in 1947. Um, and then it softened when it started coming to the mainland. It had to because nobody's going to train like that. Nobody's going to, I'm not, you know, hardly anyone. And you're definitely not going to have a successful school doing that. So I think I found a good, um, a good balance of the toughness and the, you know, the, the, the school friendly, the family friendly feel. I think I have that and I like that. I, you know, I wouldn't have minded it being more like that when I was coming up, but it wasn't, so I'm not gonna cry about it. But my gym is like that. It's a family friendly, very tough mentality. Um, always strike first, but never start the fight. And that's kind of confusing for some people, but it's not to guys that have trained with me for any, any length of time. That's yeah. question. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, I, I like what you say there about the the balance. I mean, you no one wants to be completely Cobra Kai, but yeah. You know, also, sometimes Daniel looks like a bit of a pussy. So yeah, and <laughs> if you look at the video they have on YouTube, he's the bad guy too. Yeah, or just like the new, the new series. Yeah, yeah, he's not the he's not the good guy. You you don't take just because you don't say something back. Like if someone cusses you out by not cussing them out. That doesn't always mean you take the high road. That just means you you took the whatever road, but it wasn't necessarily the high road, you know? Yeah. Hitting someone over anger, that's low. Hitting someone at, over a threat, that's low, you know? But hitting someone first, sometimes that's necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna have a guy on the, in the podcast in a couple of weeks, Tim Larkin, uh, who read the book, uh, When Violence is the Answer. Uh, so. Huh. Yeah, gotta check yeah. that out. Yeah, yeah, really. Gotta really, write a really book. Is it, my book's gonna be called "Don't Let Anyone Take Your Lunch Money." Oh, nice. Are you you writing a book currently? Kind of. Master Wong, you know who Master Wong is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good friend of mine. Um, he's been bugging the shit out of me to write one. <laughs> um, he he thinks I should have two right now, but I, I I've kind of started like a little by little. It's in in you know. So it's bits, bits and bits and pieces. I'm going to start one. Very good, man. I, mean, I, I hopefully, uh, I hope that comes to fruition because uh, I'd love to get a copy. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, we we could we could break down your career and do you know, a ten part series for sure. But uh, for those that are going to leave us here, I know you're going to hang around and do the bonus questions with us in a minute. But uh, for those that are leaving us here, if they want to find out more about you, John, where can they go? Pit underscore master at Instagram. That's my favorite. All right. On Instagram, obviously I'll put your websites and so on in the, in the show notes. Uh, John, thank you very much for your time. We're going to do the bonus round in just a minute, but uh, thanks very much. It was a great conversation. All right. Thanks, brother.
Thank you once again to Pitmaster John Hackleman for sharing his time and expertise with us. Make sure you support him on Instagram at pit underscore master and also his website, thepitmma.com. Don't forget, if you want to hear bonus content from John Hackleman and all our previous guests, go on to patreon.com forward slash managing violence. Check that out. Also, please support our sponsors, Australian Warfighters Coffee. We'll be back next week with guest Tim Larkin, author of When Violence is the Answer. It's a great show. You don't want to miss it. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon.